This is the first part of a two-part interview with Jacob Honshu, who's a Fulbright scholar currently getting his master's degree in critical theory at the University of Nottingham. We've collaborated on research, um, and he was the first editor of a journal at my university um, and did a great job with that. And I've been following Jacob's career ever since. I'm Jacob. Uh... And I like grew up in rural Kansas, um, but right now I'm studying critical theory at the University of Nottingham. Uh, the degree is actually critical theory and politics. So I've taken a mixture of courses on um, kind of critical theory and cultural studies, um, but then also with some more political science and political theory type courses. For example, uh, this semester I wrote essays on Aristotle and also Henry Lefebvre. Uh, so two people who usually wouldn't be used in conjunction. Uh, the degree program has been great. Uh, I'm trying to think what else is important about me. Uh, I did my undergrad at Case State in anthropology and geography. I did some statistics, but that probably won't come up here. And I'll be doing it a PhD. It was really useful to me. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, I guess I guess it, it's just come up some, you know, being able to like, well, I don't want to rumble, but I mean, if reification is kind of the logic of like the late capitalist world, quantification is a key part of that, right? So statistics has a role to play here, or at least statistical literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, in the fall, I'll be doing a PhD in sociocultural anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, where I'll be studying agricultural systems in Iowa and kind of meshing this with some continental philosophy and experimental ethnography. I originally came into college wanting to do like climate modeling. So I had this concern for the environment in high school, you know, you see things like global warming, peak oil, you know, all the bad things that were going on. Mm. Uh, and so, I started thinking that, I, okay, I really want to do something about this. And I was like, okay, the best thing that I can do is predict what's going to happen so we can be better prepared for, um, for it when it does happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I ended up taking electives in anthropology and geography. And one of these was an environmental anthropology course on the Anthropocene, which is, you know, the easy definition from Paul Crutzen uh, who coined the term, I think, is uh, like the human dominated geological epoch following the Holocene, which is kind of this 11,000 year stable period during which human civilization as we know it developed. Uh, so I was taking this environmental anthropology course and we're reading about all these different things. We read, you know, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything. Uh, I'm trying to think, um, there's some others. Uh, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene by Roy Scranton, and, and, and other smaller articles. Oh, Carbon Democracy by, uh, by Mitchell. But, but throughout this course, I guess the reason this is important is because in this course is where I made the connection that our environmental issues are not just this separate sphere, um, but they're linked to sociocultural forms. Um, you know, and the big shocker for me as, you know, someone from rural Kansas up until that point, you know, uh, hardcore kind of Republican type figure uh, was that like holy cow capitalism is responsible for this uh, so how can we critique society so that we can make it you know kind of less harmful so that we can stop um, sea levels from rising everything you know reefs from bleaching biodiversity from uh, perishing etc mm -hmm. so that was kind of the moment where I realized that kind of solving or not necessarily solving, but, you know, Haraway would say like staying with the trouble of the environmental crisis requires like a really thorough engagement with society as, as it exists currently. And like more importantly, probably uh, how society, society could be changed. So there's like, right, there's kind of a utopian imperative implicit in that. And that's what led me to, I mean, that's kind of the jumping off point where I shifted gears, if you will, from, okay, 
uh, I need to understand everything about this physical system and that's how we'll solve the problem. Uh, so that was me wanting to do climate modeling to the anthropologist and geographer saying, okay, how can, how is, what role is human society playing in the larger planetary earth system or whatever? And how can we possibly change this interaction, alter it, you know, critique it, make it, make it better, rebuild it uh, in a way that's less harmful, less destructive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you realize that at a certain point that the that you can't get these other changes, so to speak, unless you also change people's minds, right? Like the you have to understand the politics and the sociology and the psychology and all of these other things because that's more or less the core of the problem. Is yeah, and not not just people's minds, but also um, structures, right? So mm -hmm. kind of playing on both the, you know, the agent structure division, uh, you know, like capitalism is a structure that, you know, I've, like, I, I don't know if anybody is consciously thinking that, yes, I want to destroy the environment, right? But because of the, you know, the structural objective set by the system, right, we all play into this uh, in one way or another. Right. Well, maybe this would be a good point to ask. So, um, in your research that you want to do next, which deals with drainage, with agricultural drainage, correct? Yeah. Drainage systems, um, which is which is man-made structures that I guess were created maybe without without thinking very much about the vi environmental impact. Mm -hmm. um, do you plan on making a, a pretty direct connection between what you studied at Nottingham and the critiques that you developed with this? this research? Yeah, so um, for my dissertation at Nottingham, which is uh, in US terms of thesis, so the master's kind of capstone paper, uh, I'm trying to develop a concept that I call spatio-material hegemony, uh, which talks about how material forms and their arrangements in space, so something like drainage, you know, a drainage pipe lying three foot under the surface, uh, that takes, you know, rainwater in the super porous um, agricultural soils of Iowa and transports it to a ditch, to a stream, to a river, and to the Gulf. Uh, and with it <laughs> comes all of these uh, nutrients from the fertilizers, such as, as nitrates is, is the one that I've spent time kind of studying, but also uh, I think phosphorus is, is the other big one. Um, so, so I'm trying to de develop this theory of spatial material hegemony, which talks about how material forms and their arrangements in space uh, are not just representations of hegemonic discourses or something like that, which would be probably a cultural turn reading of them, uh, but that these spatial material forms are actual agents, um, they're actants, Latour would say, um, that, that are performing um, the hegemony itself. So the hegemony, like if you, if you wanted to point um, and say, where's the hegemony? You wouldn't say that the hegemony is here in this policy and this discourse out of which emerges these spatio material forms. You would be able to point to those spatio material forms and say, that is the hegemony. Um, the example I use um, for this is, is uh, hostile architecture or hostile design. There's a book, I don't, uh, Callous Objects by Rosenberger, if you're interested in these things. Uh, but it's, it's something as simple as a bench where there's an armrest or a series of armrests dividing it up indiv into individual seats so that a homeless person in a park can't use it as a bed. Um, so it's trying to, you know, exclude homeless people from public spaces. Uh, and the argument, you know, the, the kind of cultural turn argument would say that this is the result of a, a discourse that wants to exclude homeless people. And I would say that, that the spatial material form itself is what's doing this. So I think it's, so, so, so anyways, this concept of spatial material hegemony is gonna be useful for studying drainage in Iowa uh, because drainage is a massive infrastructural system. Uh, and no matter what we say, um, unless we destroy all these pipes or something, uh, it's still going to be there because, you know, the, 
the darndest thing about materials is that they they, they persist. Yeah. Um, so 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 it shows that this hegemony is if it's if it's material, it makes things more complicated, right? Because you have to change, or you know, if you can't change, it would cost a ton of money to change all of this, um, or at least deal with you know put in something that absorbs the nutrients as they come out of these pipes. Mm. Uh, you know, you, you have to deal with the material hegemony just as much as the the discursive hegemony. So Right. Otherwise yeah. you just have talk but you don't have any results or action. Right. right. So is I mean I've I've tried to wrap my head around this in other conversations we've had about this because as a political scientist I always go back to you know, what were, where were the decisions made and who made them, you know, and like what procedure would we have to do to make, to make different decisions, which would then result in fixing this problem. Mm -hmm. um, is part of the reason why these, why these material things have, let's say, hegemony or, or could we say agency? Yeah, agency. Uh, definitely. Okay. Is part of the reason why they have agency of their own simply because they tend to outlive or outlast the um, people who've actually made the decision. Is that why we, why it would be good to see them in that way? Yeah, that's, so that's part of it, um, which that's kind of like a particular manifestation of the larger um, kind of thought around material, like, like materials into new materialisms is, is that there's, a part of them that exceeds um, our understanding of them. So there's, it's, I think, Levi Bryant, uh, who uses this really useful distinction between wild things and domestic objects. So, right, um, this cup is domestic objects. You know, I can see that, oh, it's, you know, supposed to be a Yeti, but it's the, like, generic brand Yeti. Um, so it's a representation, you know, I can read this object to say that, okay, he didn't want to buy a Yeti or whatever. Um, and it's a cup to me, you know, I can drink out of it. I know that's going to keep my coffee hot or my water cold. Um, but so, so that's it as a domestic object, but as a wild thing, right, as a wild thing, this cup, um, it, it's more than that. So it's always more than this cup this cup right gotcha. um you know this it's also a projectile if i wanted to you know like chuck this and hit somebody um i could use it to you know as a small table or something if i flipped it over and put a board on top of it um and, and then you know also it's if you leave it out and and it becomes weathered over time right it's it's going to break down and maybe um the the little bits of metal are going to um, come apart and enter streams and then you know maybe a bird picks one up and swallows one and, and dies or something right so this traces the, you know the wild things or the excess of materialities in something like everyday objects uh, so that's definitely part of it um, but also I mean it also kind of opens up a more like like for strategy like like um, strategies of social change um it opens up some new avenues right because if materials are always kind of in excess of of our human understandings of them and our human shapings of them even uh right like this bench that i referenced earlier that is trying to prevent a homeless person from laying there right with the armrests or whatever you know or we can think of outside storefronts if there's a small ledge right sometimes they'll put little metal spikes <laughs> or something yeah. like this uh, but what we can, we can think that, you know, these are a material enactment of the hegemony, like, like, like the materials are enacting the hegemony. So we can shape these materials to disband the hegemony. Uh, you know, we can take a, take a hacksaw to the armrests on the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, which, I mean, th this is like a super vulgar and like literal, uh, example, right? But, but I mean, this shows it, right? Um, we can... You know the spikes. Uh, you know you take a sledgehammer too, uh, and and this I think is something that isn't considered as much as changing discourses and changing ideas. Uh, so, you yeah. know, like 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 Marx has this whole thing where he's, you know, he, he critiques these people for talking about ideas. And he's like, you know, whatever. 
uh, it's the material relations of man and, and everything. Uh, but right, he doesn't actually go as far as the materi materials themselves, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of the whole thing that new materialisms are trying to do. Um, Okay. So, yeah, so I'm trying to connect that, like, like connect an understanding of objects as, like, agentic and, like, unique with discourses of power and domination. Uh, so that's, well, yeah. That's, you you that's don't want to go down the new materialist road of putting total emphasis on the material agency. You right, want. yeah, yeah, because otherwise it's not a critical theory. Um, uh -huh. arguably, right? Right, right. Um, materials kind of have not, like, like materials have desire, um, right? But we, but, but this is obviously a desire that is different than the way in which it's commonly conceived. So in a certain way, you know, going back to this, like, distinction between uh, domestic objects and wild things, right? Uh, as a domestic object, this is like kind of the way in which we think of the wild thing. So um, when we think of a wild thing as a domestic object, we limit its agency. Um, we say that, you know, it has no will. We're the conscious being, it's the, you know, you know inanimate object. Um, but as a wild thing, right, like this, if we can think of it kind of as like the human unconscious, right, the wild thing in the domestic object is this force or energy like trying to break break free? Uh, so, mm -hmm. so like like um, you know this the the tendency of this material cup to rust when left out in nature um, would be a realization of that cup's um, desire. Uh, so so it's a little bit different. Um, uh, you just made a connection that I want to follow up on before I forget it, which is okay. you just said. <laughs> Um, conscious and unconsciousness, basically, that the human being is, the human being has consciousness, but also there's this, at least according to psychoanalytic theory, there's this vast unconscious. Right, yeah. Is it possible to say that the things of, um, that we make, or maybe even the things we don't, um, share in our consciousness and also unconsciousness? So, I don't think I have totally the like um, expertise. Maybe uh, you know oh. I'm not a psychoanalyst, but but I'll, I'll this, give this, this one a shot. This bothers me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I like. So you're saying like, do objects kind of like take a, like? Does this cup share my unconscious, or are you saying like? Like, is our unconscious realized in material forms? That's what I'm thinking. Okay, okay, That's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm reading this book right now by Stephen Graham, who's, I think he's a ge geographer or something. Uh, he's a British, but it's called Vertical. And, like, he's, he talks about skyscrapers, and he's, he remarks, to, you know, some people would say that these are, like, giant phalluses on the skyline or something. Um, which, you know, this is... The, the only thing I've really read that relates, um, you know, material forms to the unconscious. Uh, I'm, well, actually, th so there's a whole discourse probably in, in like art and aesthetics uh, that I'm not overly familiar with. Um, you know, and the, the entire Surrealist project, uh, I believe, was like, you know, built around trying to free the unconscious, uh, you know, awake, awake, uh, you know, modern society from its from its dream from its collective dream right so but but I, I i'm not sure i mean it's like why do we build things the way we do is this part of the unconscious or what and i'm not sure i mean i, I guess i'm just not sure so i think i think it's something i'm gonna try to think about a bit more because if you know like i've been thinking lately about um how how much of what i'm seeing going right going on right now you might describe as a sort of death drive or death cult you know um yeah and i wonder if when we so when human beings make things like whether it's skyscrapers or um i don't know like oil rigs or whatever it is that have all sorts of quote unintended consequences 
if part of what we're doing is simply reflecting our full you know consciousness as in we have our conscious purpose but we also have a very destructive you know impulse mm -hmm. that we don't recognize so right. we also don't recognize it in the things that we produce which we really should i mean it, it kind of would help explain why it is we seem to be able to produce these things without thinking about all the ways in which they can be <laughs> right, destructive. Right. Yeah, that 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 makes sense actually. Um, I'm trying to think because so the, the the only thing with this is I think it's important also right like relying too much on like the unconscious or psychoanalysis to explain these things right can like can sometimes uh right like mar or cover up uh other logics that are at play um you know for example you know with the example of uh agricultural drainage um you know why drain these swamp swampy prairies of iowa um, you know, I don't know, was this unconscious or was it more, um, you know, the capitalist logic of, you know, we need more land and, and right, like this undrained land was a frontier that could be exploited, right? So there's, there's a different logic at play, um, you know, and then, I mean, there's also, there's perhaps even more interesting questions, right, about how those logics then intersect with the, the things that you're talking about, right? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the unconscious necessarily have to be opposed because, you know, now we look back and we say, well, of course, you know, if you change the landscape that much, you're going to have all sorts of deleterious effects, which we now see. Arguably, these people weren't idiots and they could have seen some of these if they had, mm -hmm. you know, been thinking about that. But they weren't. They were thinking about their one objective, right? Which is a very classically liberal, you know, way of looking at, at everything, right? Very I've got good. this one objective. I've got the best way to do it. I'm not going to think about anything else. Um, but it's not like they couldn't have. If they had been thinking about how um, the earth supported people prior to their intervention, for instance, then they would have maybe been thinking, well, how, you know, like how much is it good to disrupt that? Maybe we should think about exactly how we want to do that to make sure we don't met. I, I refuse to think that people up until right now couldn't have had these um, ecological thoughts. Hmm. It's that it's that um, they they were so incredibly focused, right, um, on this on this one thing, perhaps that they didn't that they pushed all these other questions aside. But also, like this is just in, an intriguing thought that I just want to mull over more as time goes by. I mean, is there this underlying? Um, well, I want to call it, you know, like destructive impulse or death drive that basically doesn't care about whether things are destroyed and actually sure. maybe enjoys destroying things mm -hmm. in order to feel powerful or just because. Um, right. I don't know. I don't know what that, to do with that. Yeah, that, <laughs> I, that seems, I don't, I, I mean, I would probably like, point you to like Bataille or something because uh, he talks about like he kind of tries to formulate a new theory of political economy based on excess and like mm -hmm. he talks about like um, the potlatches in like the northwestern uh, like northwest North America where you know like these peoples and these native peoples for example would um, you know, give gifts and, and each time you give a gift, it gets bigger. And then eventually, right, like because you can't get bigger and better, um, you like burn everything. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so there's some interesting connections, I think, uh, between what you're talking about um, and, and what Bataille said on this. But then another thing that I would maybe raise uh, which is linked to what you said at the end, right? Like, like, is there enjoyment in this death drive? Um, 
I mean, I, I guess this this also raises the question of like, is is enjoyment um, the logic, right? Mm. Like, you know, if if because right, if there's enjoyment in the death drive, and this is why we aspire to it, right? Enjoyment would be kind of you know up the hierarchical ladder, which I don't like, but um, mm. that, that's the way I guess I'll phrase it. Which, which I mean, because I, I mean, I voiced this to you before, and it's, I mean, I'm not, this isn't like I'm the new person saying this, because Lacan said it, and I mean, like, probably popularized by Mark Fisher in Capitalist Realism, but, uh, like, capitalism runs on enjoyment, right? This is the logic. Uh, yeah. So, so this, I think, is what leads to destruction, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it's, 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 it's always enjoyment. But then another thing is, is you're talking about how, you know, you can't imagine that people before this time, you know, made this, um, you know, as Tim Morton would say, like had the ecological thought that things are interconnected. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, yeah, like anthropology would, would definitely show that people, yeah. I mean, native peoples have had this for ages. I mean, lots lots of different groups across the world uh, have had this ecological thought um which then you know raises the question of what caused it to go away and then reappear and mm -hmm. i think another thing that might like play in here is like the tendency to car compartmentalize um you mm -hmm. know how you're talking about i have this one goal or this one objective around which everything is formed right it's, it's kind of like a fetishization of the here and the now, you know, and I would add it as a new materialist, like it's, a, it's not just a fetishization of the here and the now, but also of the human, uh, right? So, so this, I mean, I've, I've like said, you know, not anywhere important, but like in essays, I've explicitly said that the fetishization of the here, the now and the human is what has caused, um, you know, kind of the Anthropocene or whatever you want to call this. Uh, but, but, but then, I mean, it's also, it's also what allows us to like, to a certain extent, you know, subsist. <laughs> so, so, so I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, it's part of what being a human means, I guess, to somewhat dominate, dominate nature, but the cult of domination of nature um, is, you know, be becomes problematic, right? When it's, I mean, I don't, I don't think we agree about this, but maybe we do. I've never asked, but I, I mean, I think the point where, <laughs> the point where, where people kind of decided to privatize um, and individualize religion, and then when, when secularity crept in more, for a lot of people, that's the point where there's no there's no check on their desire to dominate, right? Up to that point, I mean, one of the things for ordinary people, anyway, that, that stands in the way is respect for creation or respect for um, the fact that there's something greater than you um that that kind of you know set things up the way they are which you should tread lightly right right but yeah. when, when you hit modernity with the with the um increased questioning of that and i know that part of the you know human dominance of nature also comes from a biblical and you know biblical basis so the the two are intertwined but the, but part of the function of a lot of of um religions has been to keep people from thinking of themselves as like gods able to do anything with nature this is part of what i got from from studying Jung. right um, yeah and so i you know i realize we probably can't go back to that but it seems to me like um well maybe there's some way to to regain that perspective, because what you're talking about, I mean, it's it, it comes from a different uh, angle, but you're basically saying, if I'm not mistaking, that you know part of the problem is that human beings elevate themselves so drastically over the rest of the natural world, right? That mm -hmm. they that they don't see it as having any sort of worth without their interaction with it, and they see themselves as entirely in control of it. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if we can't, if we, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that there's not enough consensus on, you know, like going to that traditional source of, of um, perspective. Right. What do, you know, what, what do we gain from these new theorists that could help us regain that perspective? Like more than just at the theoretical level, but at the practical level of, of the many ordinary people who are like participating in the, in the capitalist pleasure economy or whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. So I, I agree, I think to a certain extent with your statements that write kind of the dissolving of religion and spirituality. And I mean, it, this is right. Like in your new book, you talk about um, the shadow uh, and, and things like this, which I think are really relevant. Um, and then I, I guess also it's, you know, uh, Char Charles Taylor, he says he has the thing on porosity, which, I mean, you know this <laughs> much more than I do. Um, but, but all of this is kind of related to what I've been saying. Uh, and, and, you know, like, you, like you've stated here, but so like, right. So I guess it's, the question is how do we kind of have like a secular religion um, for lack of like a better way of, how, yeah, how do we get that perspective back? Because it seems like the, the, some of the theory that you've been studying, like the new materialism, mm -hmm. seems to want to do that without the spirituality aspect entering in at all, yeah. right? Is right. that, can that take? Or if not, is there, you know, is there, is there some like um, fairly promising avenue that might actually... Um, appeal to people enough to capture their imaginations yeah so i mean there is actually like there i've seen some stuff on like new materialism and theology um hmm. you know, and i haven't had time to read it but but just so that like there is like a certain strand of thought that that maybe you know i mean probably definitely answers this better than i will um but i think one way of so so I read this like small piece by Timothy Morton, who's this like ecological and, and he would definitely prefer to be called ecological as opposed to environmental. Um, and he's an ecological philosopher. And he, he kind of talks about like Darwin and evolution and DNA um, and he, in the way in which these things to a certain extent, right? Like, are, I mean, he, he wouldn't say godlike, right? But this, this is kind of the impression that I get from some of these like more ecological thinkers, right? Um, instead of thinking like, you know, certain religions adopt what anthropologists call like animacy, right? Like the mountain is alive and it gives us, you know, water. Mm -hmm. um, Right. So you can think about it in this more spiritual way, but like, so following kind of Morton's, uh, what he says in this piece, you know, and another way of thinking about this would be like taking an evolutionary or um, kind of an ecological perspective on these interconnections, right? Like the mountain really does give you life. And if you, you know, like, think of it as dead and dormant and that you can do whatever you want to it yeah it is going to stop giving you life right because the complex ecosystems on this mountain you know you know whatever it is the deer the bears um you know the the glaciers etc um all of these things will be undermined you know and and in terms of evolution um which you know i mean maybe like this creates a terrible distinction, right? Because I'm, I'm saying like, what's the alternative if you don't want to go religious, which I mean, I'm more on the religious one. Uh, and I'm saying like, hello evolution, which, which creates, you know, like reproduces this terrible thing. Um, but, I, but he's, he talks about like the way in which, and, and he draws from Darwin. Um, so evolution means that everything is made of everything else and that everything has something that comes before it. Um, uh, so, right, you know, like I am made up of all of these different cells, right? And even my human cells, 
like um, for example, the mitochondria in this cell. Um, I think it, it like used to be a bacteria and it somehow entered in on as a parasite to some other organism and became a mitochondria, right? So this shows how, right, there's this like really deep interconnection between all of these different things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess to me, it's like, if this isn't religious, right? I mean, it's as close as you can get without actually capitalizing the R, so to yeah. speak. Well, it's so complex that you almost have to see, if you fully fathom all of that, you have to kind of see that you can't predict everything and don't know. It, it, you know, right. it, it's, it sets you back to where you would have that thought of, well, let's be very careful here because we don't know all of the various possible ramifications of what we're doing because mm -hmm. we're so like intertwined with everything else. So I think that and I don't want to, I, I mean, I always ask this question because I realize that we're living in a, in a secular age, like Charles Taylor says. So I always ask the question of myself and everybody else, like, how do you, how do you get this perspective without religion? That's not to say that, you know, I'm confirming religion is dead or whatever. But I do, I do think that, that thoughts like this could inform what religions we have in a, in a positive right direction right so that yeah. it would help foster this respect for and kind of oh i don't know deflation of arrogance yeah. that has been really harmful um yeah hubris obviously. right right yeah you know now i know why you like uh why why jaca lul resonated with you so much <laughs> when we <laughs> when we covered a lul um a while back yeah uh, yeah that that sort of notion that once you get something started, it, it can take on a life of its own. It has all sorts of impacts that you can't predict. Seems like he knew quite well how interconnected everything was and how, you know, we'd, we'd reach this point where we weren't seeing those, those connections. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I and I've, I've, I've like, We've talked about it a little before, and I, I'm pretty sure I've repeated what I'm about to say, like in other conversations. But you know, whoever's listening wasn't at those conversations, so here it goes again. Is that like the thing that I take most from Alul, and that is like stuck with me as he talks about, um, you know, technique and kind of like the division of responsibility through technique, which is. I, I mean, I don't know if you have a better definition of technique, but I'll try. Uh, it's not just technology as in a cell phone, um, but it can also be something like a routine or, you know, today it's what we would probably call like best practices, you know, um, things like this. Um, yeah, I, I don't, is that decent for a definition of Definitely, <laughs> yeah, like we also call it just yeah. technical rationality. Every, every, yeah, yeah. We break, we break the, you know, tasks down into smaller and smaller chunks, and each person or part is only responsible for that one, and it, it has enabled us to do an awful lot more, right, with, um, with both technology and human organization, mm -hmm. but it's also become kind of like, he seems to be saying, like a self-rolling wheel that we're... Yeah. That, that, that instead of controlling it, it's controlling us is kind of, kind of. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I, I, I totally should have thought of this before is it's like, right. Like the Frankfurt school's instrumental reason kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. But, but the, the example that I was thinking of, right. Is what technique does is it splits responsibility into all these different like compartments. Um, and he gives the example of, okay. Um, a dam is built. Um, you know, on a reservoir, river, whatever, and the dam busts and it like, you know, causes mayhem, it, you know, wipes out a village or, or whatever. And he asks, you know, where do you place the responsibility of this? Um, mm -hmm. Is it with the engineer who designed the plan, uh, the construction worker who poured the concrete, um, you know, or even with the politician, you know, who put, who decided to put the dam there? And I mean, like, trying to not just blame everything on the politicians, which I think, I mean, sometimes this is actually <laughs> fruitful. Um, mm -hmm. the, 
the, you know, like this is a great example of, yeah. Uh, where, where is the responsibility? Um, and, and also what can be done and, or how can we do it better? Um, because right, you can't have one guy build the dam, uh, you know, beginning to end, this just would not work, you know, or, or one girl or whatever. Um, but then also like, right. So as a new materialist, I would also, you know, do you place the responsibility on the concrete that broke, um, mm -hmm. on, you know, the, 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 the waters, or even, you know, you could think out as a large scale as a landscape that, um, you know, the hydrological kind of layout and, and you know, the way in which water flows across the, the, the earth's surface of the surrounding landscape is, is in such a way that um, when it rains in certain spots, you know, you get a rapid amount of water deposited to this reservoir river or whatever, which causes the dam to break, right? So the... This kind of, I think, points to a one potential way of going about answering the question of like, where do you place the responsibility? And I mean, again, this like echoes somewhat of what I, I and you were talking, you know, what we were talking about earlier is, you know, it's, it's this fetishization of the here, the now, and the human, right? Uh, if your goal is to build this dam, even if it is, um, you know, the responsibility of doing so is split up amongst all these different individuals, right? The fact that um, all of these individuals failed to account, um, or, or or maybe they did account but they didn't speak out or something, uh, right? Of these larger um, kind of you know non-human processes and actants, right? This this is a potential fault, right? This is where the you know spiritual animacies or whatever you want to call them, uh, you know new materialisms, whatever. Uh, can kind of play a role in, in helping overcome some of these like, you know, faults of technique. Right. Yeah. Because everybody involved can say, wasn't my job, wasn't my job. Right. Didn't yeah. the decision. Nobody made the decision ultimately because everybody is involved. Mm -hmm. And then the other aspect of technique, which is compelling or a Lul's co concept is that if, I mean, to kind of like boil down his point, he seems to be saying we've reached this point where where if we can do it, we will do it. Like there's, there's no choice, right? Like somebody somewhere is gonna make whatever the innovation is and then it's gonna spread and develop and all the ways that you could possibly use the technology or technique are gonna happen because we can do it, right? right. So again, there's this feeling of being more or less out of control of that process. Yeah. Um, which is, I mean, I, it totally is convincing to me. I mean, you see what what people make of the technologies that we've developed, and you know, like a lot of that is simply just, oh yeah, we can do this with it, we can do that with it, we can, you know, and let's see, can we make a buck with this? Well, it's you know, it's totally worthless, right, but yeah. but yeah, somebody will means buy it. become the ends is his. Yes. Yeah, this is the. This statement, I think, is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just so great. Um, and, and it captures a lot of, like, what you just said, uh, as well as, I mean, all sorts of other things. Uh, I mean, the examples, I think, are somewhat endless. Um, I mean, and, but, but it's also, relate, like, the one thing that, and, and I mean, it's maybe because, you know, I didn't read, like, the entire book, which I think you've read the entire thing. I have uh, once, probably twice it would be. Yeah. But but he talks right like he talks a little bit kind of about like Marx and capitalism, but he kind of I think gives it a little bit of a backseat. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas right like I guess I would push on him and ask, you know, and maybe this can lead into like some further stuff, um, right? But but you know neoliberal logics, for example, I think play a massive part in. Um, you know, the fact that the means have replaced the ends or that the means are now the ends. Mm -hmm. um, so you wouldn't necessarily agree with him that this is so much completely beyond um, human agency at this point, but rather it's the, it's the product of, an, of a particular ideology. I mean, not just an ideology, um, but I mean, like, yeah, I guess it, ideology, but like red, really liberally 
um, kind of ideology more is like worldview. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, cause I think like, like if you it, just say, okay, technique. And I think this, te like, this isn't to discredit technique as like, something useful to analyze contemporary society but to kind of ask okay this is all great you've like said what technique is but like okay where does this arise from um you know like are we just doing this for the hell of it um mm -hmm. you know or, and, and i and i think it's i mean to a certain extent yeah we are just doing it for the hell of it um right right but but also i think it's important again to um, emphasize so one way of phrasing this and I'm like trying to not skirt around too much is Mark Fisher talks right he talks about like uh, mental health and he talks about how um, you know too often it's like oh this is just the chemical imbalance um, you know depression he said he says you know it's it's read as a chemical imbalance he's like okay great so we've identified the symptom um, and as at, we've identified the symptom as the illness, mm -hmm. right? So, so, you know, in current discourses on, on mental health, you know, what is depression and what causes it? It's, oh, a chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, no, this is actually the outcome of like, right, a more structural phenomena. I mean, he, he would label this, right, like late neoliberal capitalism or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a similar like a similar kind of method or analytic can be applied to Alul, right? So technique is kind of the symptom, right? But what are the underlying, and, and this makes me sound way more Marxist than I actually am, right? <laughs> but, but like, what, what, what are the underlying, you know, structures, you know, or structural imperatives or logics or whatever, um, you know, that give rise to this particular symptom of technique as manifested in all these situations mm -hmm. right so so i mean uh, it's to me this is really useful like the 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 symptom illness um kind of distinction is really useful for kind of probing um some of these things like technique uh you know and but but what, what i mean i guess i should like try to be somewhat honest here and say that then the issue that you run into is like okay you know at what point can you say that yes this is the illness right because otherwise you're just continually lifting the curtain you know like she's zizek would say of ideology you know you can't just take off the glasses uh, right well i do think there's probably a lot of different reasons for mental illness um but it and some of which probably are purely chemical mm. but we've had such an upswing in all types um Right. And drug and alcohol abuse and, and various things um, that there's it seems like common sense to say that there's some sort of systemic factor here. Right. And I, I did appreciate what Mark Mark Fisher's point that our body chemistry. Why shouldn't we think of it as possibly affected by our environment? Of course it is. Right. Um, and so the larger by by focusing on just you know the body chemistry we can avoid the larger question of how can we create a world in which people aren't feeling so much stress and alienation mm -hmm. that they literally don't eat well or you know don't sleep well or you know the various things that can lead to depression and other uh, mental illnesses we can right. avoid that um because that's a way way bigger problem to solve um yeah right and this is right he also says this plays into you know what he calls capitalist realism uh mm -hmm. you know if you continually because because right part of this his, his you know his short discussion on like mental health is that you know what the left needs to do is you really need to politicize this right rather than just saying okay take a pill and be fine Mm -hmm. uh, you know, politicize it and, and, you know, try to point to identify, but then more than that, like, right, undo and, and or alter uh, the structural conditions that are leading to this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it's, it's eerie almost. And this is, I'm trying not to take us further off course, right? Um, but, but it's, it is actually no, really let good. Me do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but but how this relates to right the kind of like discourse of the anthropocene or climate change right mm -hmm. you know if 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 we draw the parallels of you know okay climate change you know if we're comparing these two climate change would be depression right popping the pill would be you know geoengineering or some of these mm -hmm. completely you know I'm going to just be blunt and say these things are completely idiotic. Crazy. Um, like, you know, put, uh, you know, what, some sort of particles in the atmosphere, like, it's just, you know, whatever, you know, if we want to do that, let's just, you know, set off Yellowstone, because it'll probably put some things in the atmosphere. Sure. Um, but, yeah, um, I but think right, the federal but, government has done, it. they've done tests on that very technique. I mean, that's a live possibility yeah and it's yeah. I mean, it's this is just as like capitalist realist as telling a depressed person to just pop a pill and be fine mm -hmm. um right so so it's again it's right like part of this capitalist realist ideology or whatever um of you know conflating the symptom with the illness mm -hmm. so it's just, well, it's part of a faith that we have, like maybe arguably replace the earlier one, that that we can basically fix all our problems, right? So so what if we create another problem while attempting to fix the problems we've got? We know that we can always come up with a solution. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think the coronavirus pandemic has has thrown a little bit of a rock into the gears of that faith, just because it seems like it's been, you know, particularly it's, of course, people feel it more than climate change because it's like, oh, I could, I could be dead two weeks from now because I got the coronavirus. Whereas right, exactly. climate change is something that is a little bit harder to, you know, if a, you're not going to die two weeks from now because of climate change, but your whole, <laughs> whole planet could have a serious problem in a hundred right. years, right? But, um, you know, I, the fact that we haven't been able to immediately even, like, muster the, um, the organizational forces to do our best to prevent the, uh, the spread of the disease, let alone to come up with, you know, instantaneous cures or a vaccine, I think has, I don't know, I, I feel like people are almost in a state of shock about that, you know? So. Yeah, this, I mean, so like, I, I will just make a quick point to the, you know, the domestic objects in the wild things, right? I mean, in some ways, this virus is like the best example of a wild thing, mm. right? Uh, I mean, so, so right, COVID-19, as we label it, this would be the domestic object, right? But the wild thing is this, you know, like material entity that is continuously escaping like human conceptualization mm -hmm. and, and so so it, i mean yeah I, this this i i mean again it goes back to your your thing about you know uh religions and and spirituality and how can we kind of you know evoke uh I don't know, like a limit to anthropocentrism, <laughs> you know, in a, in a secular age. Uh, so. Right, right. If if that doesn't do it, I don't know what will. But I mean, we really do need to we need to get this somehow um, embedded in our heads because we're facing, you know, an, a truly existential threat. Right. I've, I've come around to believing that. I used to be somebody who had my doubts, but it's become very clear. And I wish it were otherwise, but, you know, um, we, we, <laughs> we have to face it. Um, and if, if, we, if people still entertain this thought that, well, surely, you know, if we came up with, with uh, I don't know, vacuum seal canning and space flight, we ought to be able to, you know, deal with this somehow by changing the atmosphere um it's just gonna make it's gonna postpone i really do think that we have the ability to even you know to use our technology uh in a different way to reduce emissions and oh, yeah, definitely. we can we 
we do have the capability, but we want to have everything we want and, you know, fix the problem when it happens at the same time. Right. Yeah. Yep. This gets well, into like the, again, like capitalism as a logic of enjoyment. Yeah. And, right, like you have to almost embrace like a monkish, um, like asceticism. Um, <laughs> it, it's actually, this is, I don't know, uh, well, whatever, you know, I've already thrown us off track multiple times. So why not? Uh, well, you sort of, so that, so what you just said made me think of all things of, of Karl Marx, mainly because oh, no. he did not agree with monkish asceticism. And um, <laughs> so like, let's talk a little bit about Marx. 